I uh, come from the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine and people might ask, what's a forensic doctor got to do with fitness to drive and, and, um, and you know, coming to talk about impairment? But in fact, we have a lot to do with not just analysing crashes after they happen and with the unfortunate consequences of them, but we do a lot of work with Vic Roads and other organisations, which I'll talk about a bit later on this afternoon, in um, assessing fitness to drive and trying to make sure that the fitness to drive of people on our roads is optimal. Well, when um, Joe asked me to come and talk about impairment uh, and about the nature of impairment, I actually had to sit back and think, well, what does this actually mean? What does impairment mean? And um, went and did a little bit of looking into what definitions of impairment means. Um, I suppose in the broadest sense, they mean deviation from normal. Um, the World Health Organization um, obviously went to great lengths to provide a definition of impairment. I was quite surprised to see how tiny it was when you think about what an enormous amount of consultation and important people jetting around the world must have gone into producing this, but they say that impairment means a problem in body function or structure, which is really about as general as you can possibly get and could really apply to just about anything, um, including indigestion after a bad meal the night before or almost anything. Um, in a medical dictionary, I found that impairment uh, really does have a more general definition, really any abnormality of anything. Um, and there are various different ways of looking at impairment, which I'll talk about, and the way that we consider them when we're thinking about fitness to drive on the road or what the effects of impairment might be on driving performance. Um, so why does impairment have an impact? And, you know, I can sort of be a bit trite and say that we want to actually avoid impacts, uh, meaning impacts on the road. But it's important to think about what uh, the relationship between impairment and the driving task might be. Now, the driving task is a really artificial situation. You know, up until the turn of the last century, nobody had ever driven before. Um, people on horseback might have done, you know, 20, 30 k's an hour, whatever velocity a horse does, and people in trains might have gone a bit faster. But it, it was only um, from about the early 1900s that people actually began driving. And when you think about it, it's a really artificial, man-made environment, very dangerous environment, you put people of, of sort of arbitrary ability and health behind the wheel of a machine with a big chunk of hot metal up the front and a tank of explosive fluid up the back and you let them loose pretty well and they're surrounded by other people in the same sorts of vehicles and they're on roads of indifferent quality. You know, they might be really good quality roads or they might be terrible roads with poor signage and bad lighting and, and capricious signals. And in this totally artificial environment, we expect people to work to their optimal um, ability and, to, and to, to, and to preserve safety and to, um, to um, uh, perform in accordance with those rights that Richard talked about. In an ideal sense, I guess, we would have evolved to do this, but 100 years is really nothing in the, in the spectrum of human evolution, and the way that... Um, uh, that the road system has evolved has perhaps been a bit faster than that and people have begun to appreciate uh, the difficulties of coping with this unnatural environment but I think we're a long way from perfection yet. I um, have a background as an engineer as well as a doctor and I can very well remember in my engineering days seeing um, a picture of a person that had been designed to fit into a Holden. So taking a Holden car as being natural, if you like. Uh, some engineer had sat down and tried to engineer a man uh, to actually work to his optimal ability in such a car. And in those days, perhaps cars weren't designed as well as they are today, but, you know, the person that came out of this design study looked like an alien more than any of us in this room today. So they had eyes out on stalks and they had one arm longer than the other and, you know, very unusual looking body proportions because the car had been designed by some engineer somewhere. And... Um, really there hadn't been much consideration about fitting it into the human interface. Hopefully things have improved a bit since then. But the correlation is still capricious and imperfect and the correlation between you know, the fragile chunk of sort of gooey wet material inside the metal cage is still not perfect and uh, so we have to cope with trying to um, understand the way in which people function in relation to this very artificial environment. It is an unnatural act. Um, you know, we deal with all sorts of unnatural acts in forensic medicine, but this is probably the most common of them. Things that people have to do when they drive are often aren't natural. Um, all these things that I've listed here, 
basically have to do with how fast we're travelling and we have to take in a vast amount of information. It was very interesting to hear um, about the, the particular demands of racing and rallying, but uh, being on, on sort of domestic roads, perhaps not quite as, as, um, as difficult as that, but similar sorts of skills. People have to take in vast amounts of information, mostly visual. Um, they have to think about them really quickly. They have to be able to respond to the unexpected. You know, is there a pedestrian stepping off the side of the road? Is, has, has someone else done something silly in a car? Have the lights changed? Um, so they've got to be able to do all that really, really rapidly. They've got to be able to plan in their mind where they're going. They don't have the luxury of a co-driver telling them where to go unless it's a GPS these days and they can be a distraction on their own. And then, you know, do all these things at once and then translate them into movements of the arms and legs to control the vehicle. Road uh, trauma as a result of these things not going right is in fact the greatest non-homicide cause of traumatic death that we see at the Institute. There's about six times as many people end up in our pathology department from road trauma that end up from homicide. And for every one of those that's killed, there's a, a very large number that are injured and have all sorts of other um, effects on society. So it is an important issue and it's important because of um, legal implications I'll talk about a bit later on today. Um, there's issues of culpability. If people have a crash, whose fault was it? Was it the, um, there because there was a medical condition that wasn't properly recognised? Um, is there an issue with the responsibility of health professionals? Also a very vexed question. And of course driving essential in the 21st century. It's very hard to live in the 21st century unless you can drive and especially here in regional areas where people can be quite isolated if they can't be mobile. Well what's the evidence base for driving fitness? We'll hear a little bit about this I guess from myself and other speakers. Um, the evidence base is not perfect. It's getting better all the time and it's been embodied as best it can be in the new guidelines. There's a lot of research still happening especially to do with chronic conditions um, and this is quite important as the population ages. The baby boomer generation, as they've gone through life, have been responsible for a lot of great medical advances um, for, the, for whichever particular ages they were at. Now that they're getting to the geriatric <coughs> stage, there's a lot of interest in um, older drivers and the effect of chronic conditions as they affect people. And, and this reflects on the way that assessment methods are developed for driving fitness, and some can be appropriate and some cannot and there's the example of whether or not visual fields um, have an effect on, or can, uh, sorry, whether the effect of visual fields on driving fitness can be measured easily by other methods of testing and I'll talk about that a bit later on as well. Um, there was some reference to the MUARC review. This was um, uh, a study that was done by a group of us at MUARC. It's been done twice now. The most recent review was in 2010 and had a bit of input into um, the formulation of the most recent guidelines. It was basically a meta-analysis of the current scientific literature about various sorts of conditions and disabilities and their effect on crash risk. And it was divided into acute problems which cause sudden disability and chronic illnesses which affect fitness. I'll, yeah, again, I'll talk a little bit more about those later on. We have a lot of experience in both of these things at the Institute <coughs> because of both our, our um, role as Vic Roads medical reviewers and also because we get to analyse crashes. So when things go wrong we get to see what's happened when things go wrong and we get to see the sorts of cases that um, can happen when medical conditions might be a factor. And I've got to say over about the last 20 years the number of, of nasty, you know, death crashes that the police have, have asked us to look into that have involved medical conditions has increased and, and this may be a reflection of the greater population, but perhaps also of the ageing population. Um, certainly in the last year or so, I've probably myself dealt with about three or four of these, and this would have been unheard of 20 years ago. In, in those days, just about every death crash involved alcohol and perhaps some other extraneous issues. Now there are crashes that are before the coroner based on epilepsy and diabetes and all sorts of other medical conditions. There is actually one case, the first one in my experience and of any of my colleagues, there is one case uh, bef before the courts at the moment here in Victoria that involves hearing. So it's not thought to be a really big issue, uh, but it can happen. So how do we classify impairments? And I like to think of them this way. There's um, the issues of sort of cognitive and, and intellectual abilities. Does a person have 
the capacity for learning and can they learn to drive in the first place, whether it's, it's an off-road test or doing a knowledge test or a hazard perception test or whether they can perform and actually have the capacity to learn from their mistakes when they've got old plates. And then there's conditions that have episodic disability where people are okay in between, um, physical deformities, a, a situation that I call deceptive fitness that I'll elaborate on a bit later on, and of course the thing that concerns most of us here, I guess, which is the effect of chronic conditions, which can be physical um, and psychological or mental or a combination of all of those things. Intellectual disability occasionally crops up as a question in people's fitness to drive, and it's more than just the capacity to learn. The capacity, to, um, intellectual quotient or IQ is sometimes defined as the capacity to learn. And you know, there are people that can learn to drive and we, we uh, find it hard to assess fitness purely on a number uh, as to a person's IQ. I don't think anybody's ever been able to show a really good correlation between the actual number on an IQ test and the risk of crashing. Um, we usually give Vic Roads a sort of advice that if a person can pass a driving test, there's really no basis to deny them a licence, even though they might appear to be intellectually disabled. If they've got the capacity to learn enough to pass the driving test, uh, that's assuming that a driving test is a good gateway into, into being able to drive, then there's no reason not to let them drive. But there are people um, sometimes that are outside that frame. And sometimes it's very hard to know, you know, you can't really assess them before they actually get on the road. There's a particular patient I'll call Miss T, who is an intelligent person. This is uh, based on a case that's been before us, um, who was an intelligent person, you know, had a university qualification and all, but sustained some brain damage. And this person could pass any test you liked as far as driving. You know, driving instructors thought she was wonderful, but she lacked the ability to um, have insight into driving behaviour and if something went wrong she'd panic at one point, you know, things went wrong she just left her car parked somewhere with the engine running and ran away because she couldn't cope with the stress um, of an unfamiliar situation. So intelligence uh, and ability to learn is not necessarily uh, something which is uh, the be-all and end-all. Episodic impairment um, is an, is an exercise in risk assessment. There are conditions like epilepsy, diabetes, and the things I've listed here where people are completely okay most of the time, and then they have something that happens to them. If it's, for instance, epilepsy, it's, an, it, it's, a, it's a transient, unpredictable impairment caused by the disease. And then there's conditions like diabetes where the impairment, being a low blood sugar, is caused by the treatment. Um, but, but whichever way you go, uh, uh, people are disabled transiently and in between they might be totally okay. And they go and see their doctor, they're totally okay. And doctors or other health professionals have to rely on the history. You can't do a test in many cases. You have to rely on the history uh, and you have to rely on the person being truthful to give you a good history um, as to how frequently these things are happening. In some cases, for instance in diabetes um, or you know, conditions where people fall asleep, for instance, it's possible to modify these things by treatment. Um, in some cases, it's not. Epilepsy is a really interesting condition because it's so variable, um, and it was the basis of the beginning of our driving clinic, which I'll describe a bit later on today. A uh, highly variable condition, lots of different sorts of seizures, some of which totally disable people and some of which don't. Um, you know, some people just have a funny feeling, which is classed as a seizure without really losing awareness and they can still continue doing all sorts of things including driving. Some people get a warning, some people don't. Um, some people respond well to treatment, some people don't. Investigations can be illusory sometimes. There's another patient I'll call Miss S who um, came before us who you know, had totally normal investigations, had a normal MRI, had an EEG, even though there's a history of epilepsy years before, had, a, had an EEG that was normal when she wasn't having a seizure. And on the basis of those tests, they reassured her to the point where she thought, well, I'm cured. I don't have epilepsy anymore, I've got a driver's licence. And unfortunately, that wasn't the case. So, you know, some investigations might not necessarily be the appropriate ones for these sorts of conditions. Then, of course, there's other issues of compliance. There's a, there was a lady jailed a, a few years ago for culpable driving in Victoria that hadn't taken her doctor's advice about compliance with medication, killed somebody as a result. So there's an overall risk assessment is not simple. It's not as simple as just picking a disease and saying, yes, there's this disease, this is, this is what we need to do. We have to take into account the whole 
clinical picture. Diabetes is a classic example. Hypos may be preventable totally if a person's on an adequate regime, but there are competing treatment priorities. Endocrinologists, if you talk to them, they love to run people with low blood sugar as low as possible because that has the best outcome for the long-term health of the patient. But on the other hand, uh, that almost assumes that they're going to have a hypo at some stage during the day. And we, of course, don't like that behind the wheel. Um, if we see a report from an endocrinologist saying this person's got terrible diabetic control, we actually feel quite reassured, even though we know, <laughs> even though we know that at some time in the future they might get some of the long-term effects, um, most of which can be dealt with in one way or another. Deceptive fitness is a condition that, that, um, that I, I think about when the assessment method is really not sensitive to the impairment. So I talked about the lady with the EEG and the MRI before, which really didn't tell us whether she was going to have a seizure or not. Another, uh, other, other classic examples might be people that have got visual fields. Now, you know, these are people that have lost part of their visual field and, you know, they can drive perfectly well on a lovely, bright, sunny day down a dead straight highway where there's no other vehicles or no pedestrians or no, or no bits of road furniture on the side. But it's the unpredictable that's the issue. They can't see the whole visual field. And I was interested to hear about the fact that rally drivers need to be able to take in the whole field everywhere and they, you, know, you, you sort of do it subconsciously and you know, get a picture in your mind of it. These people can't do that so you can test them on the road till the cows come home but you can't predict what the effect of that visual field loss is going to be. So there are certain conditions like that <coughs> where people appear to be fit <coughs> but aren't necessarily so. Chronic impairments are those where there's really no prospect for improvement and there's lots of different ways of classifying those as well. They can be something someone's born with and people might have actually made an adjustment to it. People are born with visual problems. There are certain visual conditions that look terrible. You know, there's a particular condition where, people, where people's eyes dance around and they can only see well out of the side of their vision. But they can drive perfectly well because they've had this ever since they were little kids and they've learnt to live with it. Uh, whereas if something like that happened to an older person, they might have great difficulty. There are conditions that, you know, once you get a disability, it's always going to be there. For instance, a person might lose a limb. Thing, you know, that's not going to change. And, and there's also chronic conditions that gradually get worse. A lot of these people require individual assessment, and I'm pleased to see that we'll be hearing from occupational therapists about that later on today. There's also problems of you know, whether or not a person had a pre-existing impairment and then as they get older, the significance of that impairment might change. So the sorts of chronic impairments that I guess you're all familiar with are these, and I don't really need to go into great detail about a lot of these, I suppose, except to say that some of them are going to be the fairly static and some of them are going to get worse as time goes on. Older drivers are a, a, a sort of a special case and they're causing a lot of concern now as the population ages. All of these problems can be there. Um, in general, you, you saw that bathtub, that bathtub-shaped curve that Richard showed about, you know, crash. Uh, uh, sorry, about death risk going up as people get older. That's partly a, a, a combination of the onset of chronic conditions, and partly because older people are more fragile and tend to uh, have a lot more trouble surviving injuries that might not necessarily hurt a younger person or at least keep them disabled for very long. Um, the, the most difficult issue that people always worry about in older drivers is cognitive decline. That people are getting demented or they have trouble coping with complex conditions on the road and we heard a little bit about the intersection problem. That um, is something that hopefully will be coped with by better road design as things develop in the future but it's a problem that is going to be with us for a long time and it's hard to assess across a desk. It's hard to do a, a pure medical assessment in a consulting room that will give you a clue as to how much this is going to be a factor uh, for people's on-road performance. Dementia, well, that's a condition that once it's diagnosed, the decline is inevitable, and that's one of the reasons why the new guidelines have, um, have uh, put in um, mandatory regular review, the idea being that they're lost to follow up otherwise if they're not followed up. It doesn't mean they have to have complicated OT assessments every year means that somebody who knows them needs to cast an eye over them regularly and just raise a flag if they're getting worse. And anybody who's worked with people with this condition will know that there's enormous amount of variability in dementia. There's different sorts of dementia. Some people go downhill very quickly. Some people grumble along for a long time. They have ups and downs. Um, and hopefully most of them tend to self-limit 
things themselves, but uh, along with dementia comes a lack of insight and sometimes there comes a time when difficult decisions have to be made for people and families have to get involved often because by the nature of the condition they can't actually understand the difficult decisions that have to be made. So OT testing, very helpful for um, things that are required where a person has something happen to them and they're not the same person after that. So they've been quite okay and then they've had a stroke or something's happened to them or they've got a condition where they're deteriorating. These sorts of things um, are classic conditions. Any of the people here that are OTs will certainly know this. But there are conditions when OT assessment is not appropriate. You can probably guess from what I've said before that some of these unpredictable impairment conditions or deceptive fitness conditions, you can test them forever and you know, they'll come up perfectly because you're not testing them at a time when they're disabled or you're not testing them appropriately for the problem they've got. We think it's very important that people are fit to have driving tests. If they're going to have OT assessments or on-road tests of, of um, one way or another, they do need to be um, tested first of all to make sure that they comply with the driving guidelines. <coughs> Uh, On-road testing is no substitute for medical fitness, so people need to have adequate vision. Their diabetes, epilepsy, what have you, needs to be properly controlled before they're allowed out on the road, because otherwise they're putting the testers at risk as well as themselves. Um, just a bit of a word about visual disabilities or visual impairments. Um, some of the guidelines have been relaxed for car drivers. The amount of visual field that people need according to the new guidelines is less than it used to be for the old guidelines and that's going to make life easier for a lot of people. But it's important to realise that visual defects can be associated with other problems, especially if they've happened as a result of a stroke. So there are certain kinds of strokes that affect visual fields and they affect other things as well. So people's cognitive abilities um, and other things of that sort might also be affected at the same time. So it's not purely an issue of visual fields. There's also a lot of new uh, te uh, technology coming out to plot visual fields now. Years ago, a visual field was a visual field. You put a person in a dark room or got them looking into a big white bowl and you flashed little lights to see what they could see, and it was easy to do a plot. These days, there's an almost infinite number of devices on the market that will plot visual fields in all sorts of different ways. There are ones that use large targets, little targets, ones with moving targets, ones with both eyes open, one, you know, some with only one eye open, some with the eye fixed on a target and somewhere people are allowed to look anywhere they like. So um, visual field plotting is not as easy as it used to be and the interpretation of them is not as easy as it used to be either. And uh, we put a tremendous amount of time into thinking about this and we have an expert committee that helps us try and, try and make sense. These aren't all the same patient, but it's not uncommon to get a whole swag of these on a single patient. They all look different. And you've got to try and understand why they look different and actually what this means for what happens when they're behind the wheel. Just to put these sorts of risk into perspective, everybody knows about alcohol. It's been around for a long time and everybody knows about 0.05 being the legal limit for driving uh, if you're not on a probationary licence. And the relative risk of a crash at 0.05, so that's the risk of having a, just the pure risk of having a crash compared to if you're at zero. If you're at 0.05, somewhere between three and five times. And that's the risk that society has decided is unacceptable. So this is not science, really. I mean, the science tells you what the risk is, but the government or the parliament picked 0.05 because, you know, they have to let people have a little bit of social drinking, but at about three to five times, it's considered to be unacceptable. And if you're at about 0.1, then you've got about a 10 times risk, and that's the level at which the courts really give people a very take penalty if they've had a nasty crash. If you're in that central part of that bathtub curve, if you're, if you're, a, if you're a safe, experienced driver age 40 and, and you take alcohol to make you as dangerous as an 18-year-old, you have to get up to about 0.06. And uh, it's illegal to drive at 0.06, but it's not illegal to drive when you're 18. That people have the same risk. Um, but to compare that to medical conditions, some of those don't have enormous risks compared to drink driving. Um, you know, the relative risks, the overall relative risks of treated people with these conditions are not high, but there's a lot more of them. And, and so that's why we have such an emphasis on trying to do something about them, because every little bit incrementally reduces the overall risk on the road. 
me, the concern sometimes of, 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 of people who work in areas like social work and, and actually have to deal with families and so forth have to do with preserving people's lifestyles and mobility for as long as possible. And I've got to say that's also one of our aims. And I'm talking again later on this afternoon and I'll be talking about trying to put licensing conditions onto people that maximises those opportunities. Um, you know, the aim of medical review of, of drivers, well, it's partly to take unsafe drivers off the road, but, it, but it's to keep people mobile for as long as possible because, you know, it's certainly known that there are major public health implications if you take people off the road that shouldn't be taken off. Well, look, it's a bit hard to know about cost-benefit analyses in a formal sense. You did hear also in a previous talk that some of the Monash research has shown that Victoria's got the lowest rate of, um, of older driver crashes and deaths compared to places where there are different regimes. Now, Victoria has got the most lenient fitness laws in that it's not compulsory to have medical review as you get older, but Victoria does have the most thorough medical review system so that once people are known to the medical review system, action is taken probably more than it is in other jurisdictions in Australia. Now, the cost of a, of a death on the road has been variously estimated as being at least a million dollars to society. It's probably even more than that when you think about other sort of hidden intangibles. So, you know, at the moment in Victoria, there's about 260 deaths a year. So that's a quarter of a billion dollars every year in direct costs associated with death. And um, I'm not sure what the, you know, what the whole medical review industry an assessment industry costs, but it, it, it couldn't possibly be as much as that. Um, certainly, health professionals, um, you know, such as OTs, physios, doctors, etc., deal with lots of other things. It isn't the only thing they do. It isn't the only thing I do um, either. Um, but there is a cost in doing all of this, um, and uh, you know, I guess the only positive indicator I can say of of the fact that it's money well spent is that we have the lowest death rate of older drivers in, in the country.